Welcome, everyone, to another edition of About the Town. I'm Craig Coughlin, your host. As always, it's a pleasure to be with you. Today, I'm joined by Tony Orsini. He's an Islin resident and one of over 500 World War II airmen who were rescued in perhaps the most daring rescue of all of World War II. But the story of the Forgotten 500, as captured in a new book by Gregory Freeman, is more than the story of a rescue mission. It's the story of human compassion and loyalty, of international intrigue, and ultimately redemption. Tony, thank you very much for stopping by to just spend some time with us. It's a pleasure to be here. You're, you're one of the central characters in, in, in the book. How did you get to be involved in, in, in the story? Well, I, uh, one day, I received a telephone call from the author, Gregory Freeman. And he said he was doing a book on American airmen that had parachuted over Yugoslavia. And he understood that I was one of those airmen. And would I be interested in being interviewed and so, he could, uh, so I could share with him my experience in Yugoslavia. And I agreed. And, uh, so he gave me a couple of days to collect my thoughts, and uh, he called me up, and we spent about an hour and a half on the phone, and uh, the results of our conversation are in the book, and I have to say he reported everything I told him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. And so let's talk about the story, because it is really fascinating and, and compelling. Uh, it is, it's July of 1944. Correct. You're 21 years old. Correct. And you're now you're a navigator, right? And you're sent to Europe, right? What happened? Got to Italy, uh, and uh, I was waiting for some orientation that had been promised to me uh, in the states. And uh, lo and behold, on the evening of July 21, I was informed that I would be flying with a, an experienced crew the next day. So uh, 4 a.m. the next morning, I hear somebody shouting, briefing at 6 o'clock. So I got to the briefing room, and there was a big map on the wall, and uh, they had Ploesti listed as the target of the day, and the briefing officer went over the vital statistics of uh, uh, the altitude we would bomb at, and uh, what uh, resistance to expect, and, and so on. And then he, he made a strange comment. Uh, that I really didn't pay too much attention to. But he said, if you have to bail out over Yugoslavia, uh, seek out the partisans who were led by Tito at that time, a communist, and s sh stay away from the Chetniks who are led by Dra Draja Mihailovic because they are collaborating with the Germans. Well, let's well, talk about the uh, significance of the, of the target. Ploesti is in Romania, right. correct? And it was one of the major supply refineries for the German war machine, right? Supplying most of the oil for the German war machine, right. Very critical target, very well defended, too. Mm. What, so what went through your mind now? At, there you are, 6 o'clock in the morning, and they're telling you, well, off you go. I'm <laughs> welcome, welcome to Italy. <laughs> I, I was in the days, you know, I had just been there a, few, uh, a short period of time and uh, I really didn't know what to expect. But uh, then the, uh, at the end of the briefing, the uh, briefing officer said navigators will, will need, and he listed the, the numbers of the maps that were required. So I went back to my quarters and I was missing several maps. So I sought out the squadron navigator and I explained my problem. And he scoffed at me and he said, look, he said, you're going to be in the number four plane. You'll play follow the leader, you'll drop your bombs on the lead plane, and you'll come home. Don't worry about it. But ever since then, ever, whenever somebody tells me not to worry yeah, about man, it, that's when I worry. start to worry. So at any rate, uh, 8 o'clock, we took off. And how long a flight is it? You uh, left from where? From, from uh, actually southern Italy. If not, uh, Taranto is the is the biggest uh, city close to where we were located. We were in Grotaglia. It was a 716th uh, Squadron, a 449th Bomb Group attached to the 15th Air Force. So we uh, uh, got on board the plane and we took off at 8 o'clock and uh, no problems along the way, no fighters attacked us. But uh, as we approached 
the target. I looked ahead and all I could see was puffs of black smoke created by exploding shells. And um, my blood ran cold. <laughs> and I said a few prayers, I have to say that. And so we kept struggling through all this flack and I was waiting for the bombardier to uh, uh, inform us that the bombs were away. And uh, when it did, I felt the plane lurch and I realized that we had been hit. So uh, the pilot turned around to me and he said, let me have a compass heading. And I gave him the compass heading. And then he explained how badly the plane had been damaged and we had lost two engines. That was the, the real problem. That was a four engine plane. A right? four engine plane, we lost two. Uh, okay. So there we were in a crippled plane over enemy territory far from our base and in, uh, with fighters in the area. The outlook was rather bleak. But I have to say there was no panic in the plane. None of the men, they seemed to accept uh, their fate and uh, they felt they had gone through that hell and, and uh, perhaps we could get through the uh, the rest of the, uh, of the day and, and uh, have a safe landing somewhere. So at any rate, uh, we proceeded along just uh, very, very slowly. And um, as we flew, I noticed we were losing altitude very steadily. And after we had flown about an hour and a half, I realized there was no way that we were going to make it all the way back. But I didn't want to convey this bad news to the crew. You know, you don't like to yeah. give people bad news. And I was wondering why the pilot wasn't detecting the loss of altitude. And uh, so we were... There's also a risk to being crippled and being alone now, right? You're now not... You can't keep up with the... No, no, we, flights, we, we right? lost them right away. As soon so now as, you're alone. You're as soon as we got duck. hit, we were yeah. alone. And that's what scared us because, uh, you know, we were a f fair game for a fighter. You know, we, we wouldn't be able to repel any, any fighter. What sort of weapons did the plane have? We had uh, 50 caliber guns. We had uh, a tail gunner, a nose gunner, two waist gunners, and a belly gunner. Okay. So, well, uh, we... Uh, we straggled along, and then uh, a shocking moment uh, arrived when the uh, tail gunner said, "Fight us at six o'clock." And uh, I said, "Well, this is it. You know, we we can't defend ourselves." And uh, but 30 seconds later, he said, "They're P-38 fighters. They were American, American fighters. fighters, and they escorted us for about 10 minutes, and then they gave us a thumbs up, and off they went." And in the meanwhile, we were losing altitude and losing altitude, and we were down to 10,000 feet. We had bombed at 21,000 feet. Finally, the pilot woke up, and uh, he turned around to me, and he said, are we going to make it all the way back? And I said, no. And then he issued a command that still rings in my ears. Really? Abandon ship, he said. So the Bombay doors were opened, and one by one, we jumped out. Yeah. What's going through your mind when he says, abandon ship? Well, uh, uh, well, the, the thing that I thought of right away was, look, this isn't going, the worst thing that could happen. Uh, I'm probably going to wind up a prisoner of war, you know? So uh, anyway, I, I looked Well, first at, you had to get to the ground, yeah. though, right? And, <laughs> and, and, and the had, thing was that I had abused my parachute. The parachute had been given to me quite a while ago, and I used to use it for a football and a basketball and came the moment of truth when that had to get me down to the ground. And uh, so the instructions were to count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, then pull the ripcord. This is after you've jumped. A after you jump to make sure you clear the plane. Sure. And had you ever jumped before? No, no. Had you ever been trained? No, no. It was, too, it was too expensive to uh, uh, have a, a parachute uh, training. So at any rate, I didn't count to 1,003. At 1,001, I pulled. Boom. <laughs> and what a beautiful sight when that blossomed out. And then there was an eerie feeling. And I, uh, I hit a branch of a tree, turned me over. I, five weeks later, I found out that I had fractured my clavicle. And I passed out for about five seconds. And when I came to, this woman had her arms around me. And I realized I was in safe hands at that point. So. Uh, 
she then, uh, she was trying to communicate with me, but it was out of the question, naturally. But she just uh, took my hand, and uh, I followed her into a village, and I uh, was reunited with the bombardier, who had been taken to the same village. And the village people were so happy. They, uh, they showered us with every kind of goodies. They brought out a red carpet to put on the lawn. And there again, they were trying to communicate. And I, I spoke a little Italian, and I thought maybe I could get through them with the Italian, but that didn't work. No luck, huh? No luck. But talk about the, the people in the village. Oh, they were the most wonderful people in the world. Here we floated out of the skies into their land, and uh, we brought nothing with us. And uh, they just showered us with every kind of uh, uh, amenity that uh, was available to them. And the only thing they asked for in return was that when we got back, that we would tell the truth about Mihailovich. Because uh, the story was that Mihailovich was collaborating with the Germans. Yeah. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah, let's talk about that. Because this the story plays out with that backdrop. In addition to the, the World War II, there was also the internal struggle for control of Yugoslavia. Yes. Right? And there were the, there were two forces, the Tito forces who were the, the partisans and as you had talked yeah. about the Chetniks led yeah. by Mihailovic. Mihailovic. Now when the war when Germany first invaded the war, Mihailovic was the first one to do battle and he was uh, on the cover of Time magazine as a great freedom fighter. And then uh, about a year and a half later, Tito came into the act. Now the where you, where you landed was in an area that was controlled by the Mihailovich. And they treated him like God. Right. And they treated you like gold. Absolutely. Right? You, you talked you, about they, they couldn't do the, you, you know, that they, they fed us, uh, they uh, tended to our wounds, my, my collarbone, and they, uh, when we went into a village, uh, they uh, had a, a feast. Uh, then that night, they would give us the best beds in the in the village. And, and w when we arrived in the village, the uh, young little girls would come and take our shoes and socks off, wash our feet, because we had to walk a long, long distance from uh, where we had uh, bailed out to Priani, where the 15th Air Force had set up a uh, rescue mission. Now that w when you talk about all that those those people did. They did it at great personal sacrifice and Absolutely. at great personal risk, The Germans risk, right? had warned them that if they uh, helped American airmen, they would uh, pay the price. And some of them were actually executed because they wouldn't turn over airmen that they had rescued. Yeah. And the f so consequently, they, the, the, the Mihailovich forces kept you moving from village to village? From village to village. We would start early in the morning and wind up about dusk. And as I say, the young girls would come out and uh, wash our feet for us. Then we would gather around tables and they, would slaughter the, they had slaughtered the biggest pig that they had and we would have a feast. They had this uh, plum brandy called rakia. Right. We used to drink a lot of that. <laughs> and they taught us songs to sing. I can still remember the song. Peter Zube Krona is the diademo, Nabo is the diademo, Nabo is the. You don't have to keep that, <laughs> that in there. <laughs> what does that but, mean? Uh, actually, uh, it, it has something to do with uh, women being uh, loyal to men. It has nothing to do with uh, patriotism, patriotism or anything. Or anything like I thought it, uh, it had something to do with patriotism. But uh, every, and the, the same routine was repeated every day. And then ultimately you end up in, in Prayani. Yeah. How and many men were there? Well, by the time I got there, uh, 200, about 250 had already been evacuated on August the 9th. I think I arrived there about August the 15th. And I was told that uh, there was, and my pilot and co-pilot were in the group that had been uh, evacuated. And while I was there, there must have been about 150. And uh, we, 
we would gather in the, the courtyard during the day, and then at night we would go to, we'd be assigned to houses where we'd get a meal and sleep over, and then the next day we'd go back to the courtyard. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about it. Throughout the entire region, the, the, the Mihalovich forces were bringing airmen who had, had a, been forced to bail out into Priani, and, and a plan developed to evacuate all of you, right? right? Let's talk about the plan. It was a daring plan to uh, bring C-47s in and land them on this plateau and uh, then evacuate the airmen. And the, the, then it was re realized that the plateau wasn't long enough. So we had it extended at about 75 yards. And you had to build a, well, you, had, you built the plateau, but you had a. Well, the, the plateau the, you, was there. And you built, but you built well, the airstrip. We built an extension, so right. to speak, right. yeah. And then. With uh, no tools. No, no tools, no, no tools. No road no, the, the peasants equipment. No. had uh, uh, carts and uh, they would shovel dirt onto the carts. And, uh, but uh, slowly and slowly, it, uh, it, it uh, developed into a, a good landing area for C-47s. Did you, did you, were you worried that, it, you call, it's, the book is titled The Forgotten 500. Did you feel forgotten at that point? No, not really. No. Uh, the, the forgotten part comes in after the war, okay. because while we were being uh, rescued, we were heroes. And then after the war, when we wanted to honor Mihailovich for saving our lives, that's when we were forgotten. Okay. The Congress just turned its back on us. The rescue mi missions often took place at night, correct? Yes. The night of the 27th, when I was supposed to be evacuated, we all went down to the field and we're listening for the uh, sound of motors in the, in the distance, yeah. you know, the, the C-47s coming by. And then we would, uh, when we would hear that, we would light oil lamps to sort of trace out the, uh, the, the landing area for the C-47s. And uh, when, when they landed, uh, we couldn't believe it. And we all clambered aboard, we took our shoes off, and left uh, quite a bit of clothing behind for the people who had been so kind to us. Now, when you got, when you got back, you, you flew additional missions after that, right? I flew additional missions, another 35, and uh, on my 35th mission, I was wounded again over the Brenner Pass, Italy, uh -huh. and uh, I uh, was in the hospital uh, for quite a while, and then, uh, then the doctor came by one day and he said to me, um, how many missions do you have then? I said, 35. And he looked at my wound and he said, he said well, he said, no sense in having you hang around any longer. We're going to send you home. <laughs> Boy, that was, a, that was a relief to hear that. Now, your, your mother, and the book recounts this story, your mother had received notice that you were missing in action, yes. which all too often resulted in another telegram down the road that said you were killed in action. Right. So... You didn't have a chance. You had you had initially said you had gotten out after being missing in action, but you didn't have a chance to tell them, right? Because you you got you got to leave faster than you had expected, and the book recounts the story of of when you came home to to Jersey City. Yeah. Tell us the, tell us that story. Oh, uh, that 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 was a, a scene right out of the movies, because when uh, the doctor said that uh, I would be going home, I was told that I would be. Uh, sent to the U.S. via a hospital ship in April. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I think it was the beginning of March, there was a note on my pillow saying, you're going back to the States by plane in the morning. So the next morning I hop on a C C-54, was it? Yeah, that's the, the longer one. And uh, off I went and I uh, reached Jersey City and I rang my mother's doorbell. We lived in a three-story house, no answer. So my aunt lived on the second floor. I, I buzzed her and she came down and she couldn't believe her eyes when she saw me, you know. And I said, where's my mother? She said, she went to church. So I said, I'm gonna go find her. So uh, I walked down Palisade Avenue, Jersey City, and I spotted her about four blocks away and uh, I focused on her. I wanted to uh, uh, to see her react when she realized that her son 
had made it home. And the moment came when she, she, she saw me. She started to run. I started to run. It reminded me of a John Garfield picture I saw when I was a kid. And we embraced each other, tears. And uh, it, was, it was just so uh, heartwarming to, to, to see my mother again. We tried to get a, a monument erected yeah. to Anna Mihailovich for what he did for us in Washington. And we petitioned Congress, and the Senate pro approved the bill twice. But every time it went to the House side, the State Department appeared before the House and said that Tito would take umbrage if we did anything to honor his former arch enemy. Yeah. And, this, and uh, Congress buckled. They were always successful in uh, rebuffing us in our attempt to honor Mihailovich. But we honored him in our own little way, uh, and he'll always be in our hearts for saving our lives. And he was, he, he was truly a freedom fighter, you know? And uh, I can't understand our government standing by. After the war, he was uh, captured by Tito, tried in a sham trial, and executed, and our government didn't lift a finger to try to save him. To me, that's a stain on the honor of our country. Because here was a guy that had rescued so many, many American airmen, and they didn't try to do anything to, uh, and he was old at that time and feeble. He wasn't going to live much longer anyhow, but our government refused to intervene. And ultimately, Mihailovich was, was recognized by the government, right? Yes. Uh, Eisenhower actually played, played a part in that. He went to Harry Truman, and he said all the th stories that were told about Mihailovich were lies. And so uh, Truman uh, did posthumously award him the Legion of Merit. I think it's the highest honor that a, a foreigner can, can get. But the interesting part is that the award of that Legion of Merit was kept secret for 20 years. They still didn't want to uh, uh, get and it Tito upset. And yeah. it wasn't until 1995, I believe, that his daughter finally received it, right? She finally received it. Uh, and uh, there were four, I think four of the guys went over to present it to her. Wow. But, you know, it, it's just uh, incredible how they just wouldn't give Mihailovich the credit that was due to him yeah. for saving 500 American boys. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Okay. We've run out of time, unfortunately. Okay, well, I could go we'll on and back. on. <laughs> we'll have you on again. My guest, great thanks, is, has been Tony Orsini, central character in a new book called The Forgotten 500. Tony, thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you all for My watching. Pleasure. We'll see you the next time we go about the town.